The New Testament book of Hebrews is quite interesting, mostly because it's quite different from the others. One of the first questions is the question of whether Hebrews is an epistle or not, a letter. Many people say, well, no, it's not. It doesn't have a greeting. You know, you think of Romans, for example. Paul says, Paul, an apostle, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the saints who are in Rome. But you don't have anything like that with Hebrews. No identification of who the author is or who the intended audience is. Uh, it just starts right in mid-thought uh, in many and various ways. God spoke, and it just goes on from there. And so, as a result, there was some reluctance to include the book of Hebrews in the Bible. People weren't quite sure just what it was. It's more like a sermon in many ways than anything else. Um, a sermon about how you shouldn't lose sight of the end goal, how you should remain faithful, how uh, if you were a Jew, you shouldn't be tempted to go back to Judaism, how you should stay faithful to Jesus, um, and those sorts of themes. People say, well, who could have written such a sermon? Could have been Paul, but it's a different language kind of than Paul. Um, it's a different kind of Greek. It's a different vocabulary. It doesn't sound like Paul although the ideas are similar to many of Paul's ideas. So it could have been a, a disciple of Paul's, like maybe Timothy or Titus. Uh, it could have been somebody else who had similar experiences, probably a Gentile, somebody with a Greek rather than a Jewish background because the Greek is quite sophisticated. But we don't really know for sure, and as a result, um, there was a long conversation about whether Hebrew should be included or whether it should not, and finally, of course, the decision was made to include it. The historical context has to do with the changes that were taking place in Christianity. Uh, Christianity originally was a Jewish phenomenon. Jesus was a Jew. Peter was a Jew. James and John were Jews. Matthew was a Jew. All of the original disciples were Jews. The Apostle Paul was a Jew. But gradually, the message went to Gentiles who found it first interesting and then fascinating and then compelling. And as a result, you had many Gentiles who were converted and became Christians. Uh, and so uh, gradually, the complexion of the church changed from a Jewish complexion to a kind of 50-50 Jew and Gentile complexion and ultimately to a majority Gentile complexion. And these sociological changes within the church created some tensions. Um, some of the conflict had to do with whether or not Gentiles could truly become Christians without also becoming Jews. And a lot of this revolved around the circumcision issue. Circumcision was the sign that a Gentile had become a Jew, and uh, that a Jew was truly a child of Abraham, therefore a child of God. And it was a sign that was right there in the flesh um, that uh, reminded people that this person belonged to God uh, in a unique way. Well, Jews argued that Gentiles could become uh, believers, but they had to be circumcised, kind of like we would argue today that somebody needs to be baptized. Well, not all the Gentiles wanted to be circumcised. That was an issue for many people. But also, um, it became clear to most Christians that Jesus accepted people just as they were, without the need for them to become Jews first. And uh, this created a lot of conflict within the church um, with people going around claiming that uh, you may be, you may think you're a member of the Christian church, but you're really not because you have to be a Jew in order to be a Christian, and you haven't become a Jew because you haven't been circumcised. And, and, and so that created tensions. Also, another source of tension was the delay of the parousia, a Greek word that means the second coming of Jesus Christ. You see, people really thought that Jesus was going to come in a matter of days or weeks or months at the most, uh, after he went back up to heaven. And uh, now, you know, years had gone by and he still hadn't come and people were saying, well, what's going on here? So the argument of the book of Hebrews talks about how Christianity is the fulfillment of Judaism, that Judaism was kind of like a, so a series of signposts that pointed the way to the coming of the Messiah. And then the Messiah came and it was Jesus. And the Jewish people, for the most part, did not recognize Jesus as the Messiah. 
and some of them uh, were positively hostile to him, not all by any means, but those who were hostile to him managed to get him crucified. And in spite of that, or maybe even because of that, Jesus uh, was the fulfillment of Judaism. He was the outcome of everything that they had hoped and planned for. And so, um, in a sense, Christianity takes the place of Judaism. It supersedes Judaism. One of the things that gets said periodically in the book of Hebrews is that um, everything having to do with Christianity is better than everything having to do with Judaism. Jesus is a better savior. He's a better sacrifice. He's a better high priest. Jesus ministers in a better sanctuary and so on. The idea here is that Judaism has fulfilled its purpose. It has pointed the way to the Messiah. Now the Messiah has come. Judaism is no longer necessary. And to continue to hang on to Judaism is to love the shadow more than the reality that casts the shadow. It's to love the signposts that point to the destination more than you love the destination. And that's just plain silly. And so um, don't go back to that. Don't go back to Judaism. It may be appealing. You know, it's what you know, and it's got lots of history, and it's got lots of ritual and ceremony, and it's really cool in a lot of ways. But don't go back to that because the whole purpose of Judaism was to point to Christianity. Now you've arrived at Christianity. You know, you don't want to turn around and go back to Judaism. Another issue was um, even if we do have to wait, even if Jesus hasn't come right away, and even though it might be a long time before he does, um, it's worth it. So no matter how long you have to wait, hang in there. Don't grow discouraged. Don't give up. Don't let anybody tell you it isn't going to happen because it is. If you take a look at uh, Hebrews chapter 1, you'll see the fulfillment of some of these themes. For example, here's how it starts out. Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. Now, this is a clear allusion to Judaism and to the Old Testament. Long ago, like back in ancient times, as recorded in the Old Testament, God spoke to our ancestors, the Jews, through the prophets, like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Malachi and all those guys. But now, in these final days of earth's history, he has spoken to us through his son. You know, that's the center of the whole thing. That's the bullseye. God promised everything to the Son as an inheritance, and through the Son, he created the universe. The Son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God, and he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. When he, God, Jesus, had cleansed us from our sins, he, Jesus, sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. This shows that the Son is far greater than anything far greater than any human being, far greater even than any angel, a word that means messenger, just as the name that God gave him is greater than their names. And uh, then you have these verses that go on to establish the point that Jesus is greater than any angels. Apparently there were people who were worshiping angels in those days and who thought that, you know, angels were really something. And you know, the, the writer here is trying to show that angels are really not something all that great. Jesus is what's really great. So you have these uh, statements, you know, like verse 13, God never said to any of the angels, sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. Angels are only servants. Spirits sent to care for people who will inherit salvation. Uh, and so the conclusion of all that is this. We must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard, or we might drift away. And we don't want to drift away from it. Um, this is the great warning. And in Hebrews, you frequently see this pattern. You'll have uh, a piece of scripture, a piece of Hebrews that tells you a certain thing, and then it will draw a conclusion that says, so listen carefully. Don't drift away. Be serious about this. For the message God delivered through angels has always stood firm, and every violation of the law and every act of disobedience was punished. So what makes us think that we can escape if we ignore this great salvation that was first announced by the Lord Jesus himself and then delivered to us by those who heard him speak? Um, so uh, once again, you know, the message of Christianity is greater than the message of Judaism. Jesus is greater than any angels. Jesus is greater than any prophets. Jesus is greater than anybody. 
And so don't drift away. Stay firm. Hold fast. Um, don't be discouraged. Even though it may be delayed a while, it will happen. So hang in there.